It's 1881. Captain J. Francis LeBaron of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is surveying central Florida. As he travels up the Peace River in Polk County, he finds something. Fossils. Tons of them along the sandy banks of the Peace River. Giant shark teeth, whale skulls, and prehistoric mastodon bones. Captain LeBaron collects nine barrels worth of fossils and has them shipped off to a professor at the Smithsonian Institution. A few years later, Captain LeBaron returns to the region. As he's digging through the sandbars of the Peace River, amongst the bones from millions of years ago, he makes another discovery. All the bones, all the decomposition, had left central Florida rich in phosphate, a mineral left over from the creatures that lived and died in and around the ancient sea that once covered Florida. And phosphate, it turns out, is a valuable ingredient for making fertilizer. They called it white gold. There's interest in the fossils, but paleontologists don't get the chance to dig because the mining companies get there first. Soon, Polk County became the self-proclaimed phosphate capital of the world, and the area was producing three-quarters of the nation's supply. By the late 19th century, railroad tracks had sprung out in every direction across the region, which helped move all that phosphate. There was a lot of work and not enough workers to get the job done. So phosphate companies paid a fee to the state of Florida in exchange for prisoners to fill the labor shortage. Black men, arrested for petty crimes, were forced to dig ditches and push wheelbarrows full of white rock while under guard. It had become a new form of slavery. This song they call Shove It Over, and it's a line and rhythm pretty generally distributed all over Florida. It was sung to me by Charlie Jones on a railroad construction camp near Lakeland, Florida. This is Zora Neale Hurston, the novelist who became a central figure in the African-American cultural revival of the 1920s and 30s known as the Harlem Renaissance. When I get in the hill and noise, I'm going to spread the news about the Florida boys. Shove it Hurston grew up in central Florida, and in 1927, she moved to Polk County to collect and record stories and work songs from black Southerners, songs that were passed down from generations. Some of the workers who taught Hurston these songs were setting down railroad tracks and working in the mines to move phosphate. Hurston described these men who worked long, hard hours in Polk County in her memoir, Dust Tracks on a Road. They go down in the phosphate mines, Hurston wrote, and bring up the wet dust of the bones of prehistoric monsters to make rich land in far places so that people can eat. But all of it is not dust. Huge ribs, 20 feet from belly to backbone. Some old-time sea monster caught in the shallows. Shark teeth as wide as the hand of a working man. It was these fossils, tossed to the side by mining operations, that gave this region its new name, Bone Valley. As the decades passed, phosphate mining evolved. Instead of convicts with shovels, they started using dragline machines, like the one operated by Michelle Schofield's father, David Somme. These giant machines excavate the topsoil and produce towering 200-foot mountains of white sand called gypsum stacks that loom over the Polk County horizon. By the 1980s, some of the mines in northern Polk County shut down after depleting the soil of its phosphate, and mining operations moved further south. But you can still see the scars the industry left behind. The mined-out areas were left to be reclaimed by nature. Dense vegetation grew around these deep mining pits that filled with water. Which is why you see these long, narrow bodies of water in the region. Like the ones in North Lakeland, where Leo, his dad, and friends continue their search 
for Michelle Schofield. Sorrow's depths are endless in this valley of tears. I wanna see a revelation. I wanna know who you are. I'm reaching out in desperation to the one. Valley, Chapter 2, Cumbie Critters. It's been almost 48 hours since Michelle went missing. There was no sign of her until one of Leo's friends saw the orange Mazda just off the eastbound side of I-4, a major highway that runs through Polk County and connects Tampa and Orlando. Now, A new wave of panic washes over Leo as he and his father speed to where the Mazda was seen. A few of Leo's friends and Michelle's dad follow them there. So when we get to the car, we find the car. Obviously, we didn't touch the car. I didn't want anybody to touch the car. We looked in it, we had flashlights, and, you know, obviously it was mine. But there's no sign of Michelle. It's nearly midnight. Leo knows he needs to call the sheriff to get someone out here and quick. The car's right by the Polk City exit ramp on a rural stretch of the interstate. I didn't even know where I was at. I mean, I wasn't lost, but I, I've never been in this area. So I went up on the embankment. I climbed the embankment and got up on the road. And you couldn't see a store from, from the highway. But I went up anyway to look. And when I got up to that overpass and walked just a few feet up behind a tree line, there was a store up there. And there was a payphone. So I went over there and I made, a, I made a call to the sheriff's department and I told them that, I told them who I was, told them where I was, and that we had found the car on the side of the road. And they asked me if I was going to take it home. I said, you're apparently not understanding who I am. My wife is still missing. I found her car. I did not find her. I need some help. I'm expecting, we'll be right there, Mr. Schofield, you know what I mean? And Batman shows up and everything gets fixed and stuff. No, it didn't work that way. Finally, deputies arrive and the crime scene unit is called in. They start inspecting the car. Some stereo equipment in the Mazda is missing. Leo doesn't want to waste any more time. He wants to start searching the area for Michelle. And I told Detective Russell, I'm, gonna, I'm going to be out here in the ditches and in the median of I-4 looking for anything. But the deputy tells Leo to wait because they're going to fly a helicopter over the area at sunrise. So Leo and the rest of the search party get a few hours sleep before meeting up again. I literally am there at daybreak. And so the plan was to search I-4. They search both sides of the highway, including the median. Leo, his dad, his friends, and Michelle's family cover the six-plus miles of I-4 until they reach the exit for State Road 33. There is no sign of Michelle. Nobody that we knew had heard from her. Nobody. This is Michelle McCluskey. She's Michelle Schofield's best friend. It's mid-morning now when they come onto State Road 33, which connects I-4 the highway where the car was found, to Cumbie Road, which was Michelle's last known location. They decide to split up. Leo's father will start searching one end of State Road 33. Leo and Michelle McCluskey will start at the other end of State Road 33 
and they plan to meet Leo Sr. somewhere in the middle. So Leo and Michelle McCluskey jump into her boyfriend's pickup truck. I was just terrified and just really focused on really trying to find her. It's slow searching. They walk a stretch of the road, get back in the truck, pull up a bit, get out and search again. When Michelle McCluskey and I were looking in one particular area, there was a a sheriff's car that went by real fast, heading down 33 toward where my father was looking. And the second car went by. I said, no, I'm following this. Something's going on. Leo jumps in the pickup with Michelle McCluskey in the passenger seat and tries to catch the sheriff's car. Ahead in the distance, he sees an 18-wheeled truck jackknifed in the middle of the road. Some cars are parked on the shoulder. I almost turned off because it was so congested. I thought it was a car accident. You know, and I thought this, this was going to be one of them things where it turns out to be nothing. And uh, I wish that it would have been. Leo keeps driving toward the congestion. A helicopter's on the ground at the scene. Somebody's missing and you come up on a scene like that and the helicopter's set down and the ambulance is there. You just know all of a sudden nobody has to tell you what it is, you know? I saw my father's truck down there on the side of the road and all these other vehicles, and then he was coming out of the woods, and uh, he had his hands in his cover in his face, and I knew they had found her, and uh, I didn't even stop the truck. I mean, I slowed down enough, and I jumped out and, and went running, and uh, everything was blending together and going super fast. Leo jumps out of the pickup and runs along the side of the road. Yellow crime scene tape has already been tied between a pine tree and a sign that reads, No Dumping of Rubbish. The tape cordons off a short, sandy road that cuts through the tree line. Beyond it, Leo sees men in suits standing in front of palmetto bushes, looking down into a drainage canal. Leo now knows Michelle is back there and he's trying to push past the deputies to get to her. His dad grabs him and keeps him from reaching the canal to keep him from seeing Michelle's body. And he kept saying, she's gone. And I was trying to hold on to some kind of, my mind was doing it, fabricating some kind of possibility that you're not right, she's not dead, It could not possibly end like this. I mean, it's just unreal. And it was like my whole world was just fragmenting. And I wanted so bad to just run back there and just grab her. And if I could just hold her, I'd hold her and she'd still be alive. And I you just, I can't, it can't end like this. It just, it can't end. We looked too hard. I've been up too long. I'm going to save her. I mean, it just, just, I just lost it. I ended up punching the ground. I was pulling grass out. I hit the tree. And I kept saying, she's not dead. She's not dead. And then all these people are coming around me because I'm flipping out. I end up in between these cars. The cops come around one side of the car towards Leo. His dad comes from the other side. And I'm telling him, don't touch me. Don't come near me. I want her out now. I just want her out. I ended up just falling down and sitting against the front tire of a car. And I came in glued. Michelle's body is floating face down in a drainage canal off State Road 33 near an old phosphate mine. There's a large piece of plywood partially covering her body, resting on her back and legs. She's still wearing the red pants she wore to work that day and a sleeveless white top. Her autopsy would later reveal that she'd been stabbed 26 times. And scrapes on her back were consistent with her body being dragged after she was killed. Officer Richard Cachadorian, 
who talked to Leo and his father the morning after Michelle disappeared, hears about it on the news. I remember coming to work one night, and there, there it was on television. And she was found not far from where I'm sitting right now. He feels bad for the Schofields and picks up the phone to offer his condolences. Leo Sr. answers. And it was definitely a very peculiar conversation. He talked about a premonition that he had. What Leo Sr. told him was so odd, Kachadorian decided to write an official report about the call. His report reads, Mr. Schofield advised Ryder that he received a premonition the night prior to the discovery of his daughter-in-law, possibly from the Lord, advising him where Michelle could be found. He told me on the phone that night that he discovered the body, and the body was in the water, and that she was looking at him, and that she was smiling at him. Michelle was smiling, Leo Sr. said, as if saying, thank you for finding me. This is especially odd because Michelle was floating face down and had plywood on top of her. It was strange, and that's how I thought of it. It became extremely strange, and I got, um, I mean, it, it frightened me to a certain degree. And if you know that landscape, you just don't happen upon, you just don't drive down that road and happen upon anything. That's really dense vegetation, snake-infested water. I mean, you either have to know something's there or somebody directed you there, or you knew something was in that area. You know, in hindsight, uh, Gilbert, what I feel he was doing was confessing. That was definitely one of the oddest phone calls in my life. When three dozen former Brooklyn Navy Yard workers found themselves irreparably poisoned by the asbestos they used in the construction of the battleships that won World War II, Perry Weitz and Arthur Luxemburg literally put everything on the line to successfully represent them. Since then, they have championed the rights of over 50,000 regular Americans injured through the negligence and malfeasance of mainly large corporations. Their ability to level the playing field against seemingly insurmountable odds has led them to litigate against such diverse opponents as Big Pharma, all the way to government agencies responsible for a generation of United States Marines being sickened by the water at Camp Lejeune. Weitz and Luxembourg take it personally when there's a miscarriage of justice anywhere, and therefore, they feel a sense of responsibility to support Lava for Good podcast. You can learn more about them by visiting whitezlux.com. That's W-E-I-T-Z-L-U-X dot com. There is a, a piece of wood board. Oh, the okay. plywood, right. That was covering the body. Right. I do have that, so I'll bring that out. Just a minute. We've been reading about it for months. It's just so funny that it's here, actually. Right. Kelsey and I are talking to Shane Kent, who runs the evidence room in the basement of the Polk County Courthouse. Shane's in his early 40s with tattoos and gauged piercings. He's going to show us all the physical evidence from Michelle Schofield's murder. So how it's going to go down is I'm going to try to keep control out of all the evidence. Sure. I'm going to be the only one handling it. If I drop off a piece, let you look at it, examine it, if you want to take pictures of it. The only thing that I do not recommend any, any pictures being taken is of the victim is any kind of nude Part, sure. Because gotcha. some of the wounds are in her chest, and her bare chest is exposed. So. Okay. Understand. Okay. Yeah. All right. If you want to, guys, have a seat, I'll start bringing stuff up. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Shane. Every time someone asks to see the evidence from a homicide, the state attorney's office is notified, and they can send someone down to observe. So we have an armed officer with us, and she's going to be watching as we look through all the evidence. All right, um, got a nice little table out here for you guys. Oh, that's lovely. Kelsey and I sit side by side at the table, and Shane starts bringing out the evidence. The plywood that was covering Michelle's body in the canal where she was found. Plywood that was found on top of the body in that little swamp. Maps of Lakeland mounted on foam boards. Oh, wow. Ah, okay. Here we this go. Is the map. Michelle's time card from Tom's restaurant. See, there's the downy bottle that they found the typo on. The blood-smeared downy fabric softener bottle that was found in the back of the Mazda. The downy bottle very much looked like a 
downy bottle from the 80s. You know, it wasn't like the one you'd be able to buy at the store today. You know, for me, this all happened before I was born. So seeing some of that stuff, I was able to like better place in time. Like, oh my gosh, okay, this happened and it was 1987. Then Shane brings out Michelle's clothes. Each piece is contained in a clear plastic bag. Her jacket, her top, her bra and underwear, and the red pants that she wore to work. That was all there as well. And this is the gray jacket. The jacket and the top, they'd been slashed, and there was a, a lot of dried blood on those items. I look at Kelsey. We both know what's next. Shane starts with photos of Michelle as she was found, floating face down in the canal under the plywood. A few more like that, without the plywood. Then he brings out the photographs from the autopsy. There are pictures of her face, her head tilted to one side. She looks like she could be sleeping, except she isn't. And the wounds are horrific. We've been studying this case for months now, but in documents, the crime can feel abstract, with Michelle described only as the victim. By this time, we'd met Leo, some of Michelle's friends and family, and now she's no longer some stranger or the victim on an autopsy table. And your heart just breaks, trying to imagine the pain and devastation they felt when Michelle was killed. That's all I can think about seeing these photos. That's everything. Yeah, that was a, not so pleasant. Not a lot of cases are. No, I know, but. Right. Whew, I'm gonna need to decompress. Yeah, I'm sure. Kelsey and I aren't saying much on the way back to the parking garage. The summer heat is stifling, and it's the end of the workday, so there are people all around us. We get to our car, where we debrief. I mean, I was thinking about her and, like, the pain she must have felt and how scared she must have been in those last moments. I think... You know, there is also the proximity and age. I was thinking about, you know, also like myself and and all of my friends who are young women and um, could potentially be in a situation like that. Grief and heartbreak overwhelm everyone close to Michelle in the days and nights after her body is discovered. When it comes time to arrange her funeral, Leo is in no shape to help. My dad took over everything. I could not make a solid decision for me for anything. I couldn't decide what clothes for her to wear. I couldn't decide what color the casket should be, what kind of casket should be on. Those things were so foreign to me. How do you decide what kind of casket to put your dead wife in? But there's one detail Leo does care about. Michelle's dad wants a closed casket wake. And I just could not leave her without seeing her again. I just could not do it. So Leo makes an arrangement with the funeral home. 
They'll hold the wake with a closed casket, but an hour or so before, they'll let Leo see Michelle one last time. The funeral director tells him that to view Michelle, they'll need a high neck shirt to cover her wounds. And I was flabbergasted. I was like, what wounds? When Michelle was murdered, I was originally under the impression all the way up until the wake that she was drowned. And uh, that's when my father said they were stab wounds. With Leo in his debilitated state, no one had wanted to tell him exactly what happened to Michelle. Obviously, I I knew somebody had killed her. Um, Why or how was beyond my ability to think. Stabbing her is beyond that. You know, it's just, it's just beyond that. And for me, that was the whole thing cast again, reliving it all over again, a different scenario, somehow worse than the drowning. At the wake, Leo is given the private moment he wanted to see Michelle one last time. And walked into the the viewing area. I've never seen a dead body. I've never been to a wake. I've never had any experience like that. So I really wasn't prepared for any of that. And she was laying in the casket. And I had, I had told myself that I wanted to see her because I wanted to kiss her one more time. She was so cold, I couldn't do it immediately. I felt her hand, she was ice cold. And she didn't even look like her. I mean, Michelle without life was not Michelle. I did manage to, um, it took a while. I managed to kiss her. It didn't help me. (laughs) I kept thinking, I gotta just figure out a way. I gotta go back. All I gotta do is get back to this minute the one I was looking for, instead of going this way, if I just go that way, I could have ran into the car, you know. But just any, just that minute, if I could just get back to there, I could, I could make it all go away. And you can't go back. There's, there's no way to go back. My life has been chasing that, going back, ever since. After the wake, there's Michelle's funeral. The church is filled with young people, and they've come to remember Michelle. We met in fourth grade, and um, I don't know, we just, we hit it off like right away, you know, as little kids. This is Michelle McCluskey. She was Michelle Schofield's best friend. As kids, they did gymnastics in the front yard, listened to music. And then, as they grew into teenagers, they would go to the roller skating rink almost every night. They also played a lot of sports with boys in the neighborhood. She seemed to be kind of good at almost everything. I remember always thinking how strong she was. She could do things physically that a lot of girls our age couldn't do. She was kind of rough and tumble. You know, she had an older brother and a younger brother. Um, She wrestled with them and stuff like that. But she was, um, you know, she wasn't like a tough girl or anything like that. She was very, very sweet and feminine and like always like to do her nails and have her hair done and that kind of stuff too. When we were younger, they lived in a, in a small mobile home. It was a single wide mobile home and it was so small, but Ricky had a full drum set in the living room. Ricky is Michelle's older brother. The whole family loved music, playing, singing, you name it. Ricky and his father, David, both learned the drums. Michelle's grandfather played the banjo. Of course, then we started listening to rock and roll. And if you met her, you would never guess that she liked heavy metal rock. You know what I mean? Kelsey and I reached out to Jesse Somm, Michelle's younger brother. Today, he's an artist, and we met him at his studio in Port Canaveral. It has big garage doors that open onto the marina. Dozens of his metal sculptures hang from the walls and ceiling. He keeps a picture of Michelle at one of his workstations. She was um, she was trying to do more musical stuff, too. You know, she was really good at singing and stuff like that. And I think she was just trying to find her voice 
you know, and uh, was kind of suppressing it because everybody has to work and pay their bills. You know what I mean? But I think that that was really her kind of creative thing that she, how she could express herself. Jesse and Michelle went to a lot of heavy metal shows together when they were growing up. He's only 16 when Michelle moves in with Leo. He comes home one afternoon when he hears that Michelle's body has been found. I think I had come home and, uh, and I think my grandmother actually told me because I don't think my dad was, was there. I was hoping not to witness his state of being at that moment because, you know, he just, you know, crumpled. We asked Jesse if he thinks his dad, David Somm, would talk to us. But Jesse tells us that his dad doesn't even like to talk to him about Michelle. It's still too painful. As a matter of courtesy, I mail David a letter telling him what I'm doing and offering him the opportunity to speak with me or to ask any questions. But I don't hear back from him. In the days following Michelle's funeral, Leo is having a hard time processing these new details of his wife's death. Now, he's forced to think about the violence Michelle experienced in her last moments. Uh, I know Michelle. And there's no way that anybody who knew her was capable of doing this to her. It's not possible. And so I'm looking for some monstrous thing that you can't describe in a human form. You know, it's just a, a monster. Leo and Michelle's friends are also trying to make sense of Michelle's murder, and they're trying to figure out who might be responsible. At the time, you know, we were suspect of a lot of different people, you know. Yeah. I mean, you, you sit, sit around in your mind, you, you try to, who could have done something, you know. As terrible as that. This is Dave again, the bass player in Leo's band, and his wife Liz. There was a couple of people that uh, we wondered about. My first reaction when we got the phone call that night, at the same time that this happened and just before, there was like five girls in the area that had been killed. One of them was even right down here off Cumby Road, dumped on the railroad track. Cumby Road is the street where a lot of teenagers hang out in Lakeland. A lot of crime happens here, a lot of theft, fights, sometimes murders. It also happens to be where Tom's restaurant is, where Michelle was working the night she went missing. So my first reaction was, oh my God, it's got to be that same guy. He's come over here. So I just, that was my first reaction. It was that serial killer that had been running around I-4 corridor. But their minds always return to those closest to Michelle. And word was getting around about how Leo's dad claimed a premonition had led him to Michelle's body. The sheriff's department was looking at that and thinking, yeah, that don't sound right, you know. And to be honest with you, there were times when we kind of suspected he may have, because there again, at a time like that, I mean, it's such a terrible thing, you know, you, you try to figure out who, who in the world would have done something like that, you know. That's what the Polk County Sheriff's Office would have to figure out. Two experienced detectives were assigned to the Michelle Schofield case, Detective Weeks and Detective Putnell. I could try to describe them, but it, it might be better coming from the longtime reporter for the Lakeland Ledger, Susie Shottlecotty. I was covering cops then, so I do remember having a lot of, of murders going on at that point, and a lot of things that went unsolved. Susie has been reporting on the courts in Polk County for over 35 years, and she's married to a retired detective with the sheriff's office. She knows just about everyone in Polk County. First, I asked her about Detective Robert Weeks. Oh, yeah, Weeble. Did you call him Weeble? Yes. This <laughs> <laughs> little short guy, he's kind of built like a Weeble, you know. <laughs> Weeble's wobble. Then I asked Susie about Weeks' partner, Detective Putnell. Oh, God. Richard Putnell? Dr. Death? Oh, God. He has the personality of a dial tone. I mean, they called him Dr. Death because he, he was always at a crime scene. But he was, he was the typical chain-smoking, rumpled suit, tall, lanky, 
detective. I mean, he was just what you would imagine, an old crusty, smelled like smoke all the time detective, you know? Kelsey and I tried reaching out to these detectives without luck. We sent email, left phone messages, and knocked on doors. It was almost like word had gotten out about what we were doing. Very few people from the sheriff's office, active or retired, wanted to talk to us. But there was one guy. His name is Grady Judd. He's the actual sheriff now, and it's fair to say that he's the face and the voice of Polk County. This is a wonderful, safe community. I love the people here, and in turn, the community here overwhelmingly cares for each other and looks out for each other. It's a good place. Sheriff Grady Judd is a white man in his mid-60s. He wears glasses and a green uniform with his sheriff star pinned to his chest. He's known for his campy, tough-on-crime press conferences, which often involve props and pictures and often go viral on social media. In 2006, his deputies chased someone suspected of killing a police officer into the woods and shot him dead. After the autopsy, Judd was asked why deputies fired 68 bullets into the suspect. That's all the bullets we had or we would have shot him more, he said. We don't choose to shoot people. They choose for us to shoot them. And if you choose for us to shoot at you, we're going to shoot at you a lot. That's a guarantee. When we met him, some Lakeland rappers had just released a new song, Duckin' Grady Judd, and they made a music video that pokes fun at evading cops in Polk County. The sheriff loved it. Well, we got him. I'm kamikaze, hard-headed, I don't learn. I told mama I'm a count, I got a thug. I'm in Polk, Duckin' Grady on a run. And by the way, we're going to do an encore together. It's already scheduled. I told them, I said, they said, can we do an encore? And I said, yes, I love it. Because the first one, I didn't have anything to do with it. They pulled my clips off the YouTube. And this one, I'm going to have a cameo appearance. And they said, can we, uh, can we shoot part of it with, with your SWAT vehicle? And I said, well, sure you can. Judd is so popular in Polk County he recently won his fifth consecutive term as sheriff, running unopposed. He tells us he grew up in the Cumbie area, that same part of Lakeland where Michelle worked and where bodies were turning up. They used to call me a Cumbie critter. When I was a kid, I'd run around talking about being the sheriff, and they'd say, you're not going to elect some kid from Cumbie Road to be the sheriff. I said, yeah, they are. They're going to elect me. No, they ain't going to elect a Cumbie critter. Well, they did. Here I am. Grady Judd was just 18 when he joined the sheriff's office. But since he was too young to legally purchase ammunition for his service weapon, his father had to buy it for him. Judd quickly rose up the ranks, and just a few years before Michelle Schofield's murder, he was supervising 44 employees, all older than him. And Judd is the first to admit that it's a pretty bad sign when a kid in his 20s is running the criminal investigations unit. You know, I like to think that I'm sharper than the average bear, but that's just a personal opinion of me. But the reality is, we should have had people with institutional wisdom running a criminal investigations division back in the day. And we didn't. So we had a young, upstart college kid who read a lot and was intuitive when the real mature leaders weren't there. In Polk County in the 1980s, violent crime was rising dramatically and Grady Judd was alarmed and frustrated by the growing number of unsolved homicides. Back then, they didn't really have the resources to keep up. We didn't have DNA. We didn't have cell phone tracking. We didn't have stores and intersections with cameras. On top of that, Grady Judd says they didn't have many experienced homicide detectives back then, and there were too many murders for them to handle. They'd start working one murder, but then another murder would come along, and they'd have to stop what they were doing to move on to the next one. The year Michelle was killed, the sheriff's office handled 27 homicides, its second worst year for murders in a decade. There were nine recent murder cases that had gone cold, and now detectives from the Polk County Sheriff's Office had another killing on their hands, with very little evidence to go on. Making matters worse, a month before Michelle's murder, Polk County Sheriff Dan Daniels 
a self-avowed white supremacist, was forced out of office by the governor. On the same day Michelle's body was found, there was an overhaul of the department and massive reorganization underway. Many officers in the Polk County Sheriff's Office resigned. I didn't because my goal was to make this organization better, not run from a challenge. But it was tumultuous during those days. With the Sheriff's Department in turmoil, Detectives Weeks and Putnell do what they can with the resources available to them. The first thing they do is canvas Leo and Michelle's neighborhood, knocking on doors. And they begin to hear stories from neighbors of arguments and loud noises coming from the young couple's trailer. But nobody had seen or heard anything unusual on the night Michelle disappeared. Until Detective Weeks shows up at the trailer of Ricky and Alice Scott, who live across the street from Leo and Michelle. Ricky didn't see anything, but he says he's concerned about his wife getting involved in the investigation. Alice, who's in her mid-30s, stays up late, and she's the neighborhood busybody. She's been known to call the cops on kids for riding bikes on her lawn, and she tells Detective Weeks that, yes, she did see something suspicious on the night Michelle disappeared. She says she heard a noise and looked out her bathroom window. The Schofields pulled up to their trailer in the Mazda. She watched as Leo and Michelle went inside. Then, Alice says, she hears a scream. She says she stays at the window, waiting, until Leo emerges from the trailer. He's carrying something large and heavy that he places in the back of the Mazda. He closes the hatch, starts the car, and drives away. With that single statement, Alice Scott puts the investigation's focus squarely on Leo. Eyewitness testimony is not your best evidence because people in a traumatic event, perception can be skewed. They mean well. Some don't mean well. Some there's an ulterior motive, but for the most part, your eyewitnesses mean well, but they're scared to death, and their perceptions may not be exactly as it occurred. But if somebody didn't talk, it was hard to solve a murder back then. As detectives Weeks and Putnell interview Leo and Michelle's friends and former roommates, they learn that the young couple had a volatile relationship. There were stories about loud arguments in the trailer, Leo screaming at Michelle, some noises that sounded like slaps, red marks on Michelle's face, stories of Leo dragging Michelle by the hair. As the days turn to weeks after Michelle's murder, Leo can feel people looking at him differently. Word is getting out now that there's a witness pointing to Leo as the main suspect. At one point, Leo calls Michelle's dad, David Psalm. He said that um, he was informed by Detective Weeks to um, not have any contact with me until this was over, that they believed that I did it. And I said to him, you don't believe that, David? And he said, I don't know. And uh, I was silent for a few seconds, and I said, okay. All right, and that was the last time I spoke to him. I understand his pain, but when he said that, it really, really hurt because you should know me better than that. Um, but he needed something to hang that hat on, you know, something to make sense of it, like we all did. And, uh, but when he said that, I really, really started feeling the weight coming down. And it's not just Michelle's dad who turns his back on Leo. Michelle's friends are talking to detectives, too. Michelle was a very, very beautiful girl. And she always dated very nice-looking boys. And when I met him, he just didn't seem like the kind of person that I would think she would be interested in. He was kind of small-built, kind of grungy, and he just didn't seem that attractive to me. It just 
I, it just rubbed me weird. I just didn't understand what she was so interested about. You know, I don't, I don't know. Michelle McCluskey was the maid of honor at Leo and Michelle's wedding, but she still had her doubts. I remember not, not being sure that it was a good thing for her and being concerned, you know, but she just, she always convinced me it was okay if they were not getting along or she was unhappy or anything like that. She didn't tell me. But after Michelle went missing, Michelle McCluskey remembers one moment in particular, after her first night of searching for her best friend, when questions about Leo started to creep in. We spent that whole day looking for her and stuff, and it was sometime late into the night, and we went back to their house, and I fell asleep on the couch. And then I heard a noise or something. I woke up, and he was standing in the living room with the front door open, just kind of looking outside. And that was the first time that I thought, what if? Like, what if he did something to her? And it made me kind of scared that I was there alone with him. Soon, Michelle McCluskey would learn that Leo's neighbor, Alice Scott, told detectives she heard Michelle scream, then saw Leo carrying something heavy to the Mazda. If that was true it would mean that Michelle McCluskey was sleeping at the crime scene where her best friend had been violently murdered the night before by the man she was now alone with. Being in the house the next day and there's no blood, nothing's broken, no holes in the wall, no, you know, there's no sign that anything like that happened in their house. So I just thought, well, that just doesn't make sense. I had decided there was no way he could have done it because blood would have been all over the house and it wasn't. But what Michelle McCluskey didn't know was that busybody neighbor Alice Scott told police that she saw something else the day after Michelle Schofield went missing. Leo bringing a carpet cleaner into the trailer. Detectives Weeks and Putnell continue to question Leo, and he can feel the pressure mounting. And because he feels that he has nothing to hide, he never even thinks to bring a lawyer along. The fact that you're questioning me about the murder of my own wife was extremely uncomfortable. Uh, I've told this story a zillion times. It doesn't change. Um, I don't have any answers um, to what actually took place because I wasn't there. To be in that position, um, it, it's beyond trying to prove your innocence. It's beyond that. There's a, there's a, a sludge that covers you when you're being questioned for such a thing. We're not talking about robbing a store or a cocaine charge or something. We're not even talking about a murder, which is bad enough. This is the murder of my wife whom I love, and now I'm forced to prove that to someone I've never met before and obviously doesn't have any idea who I am. Leo asked to take a lie detector test. He wants to prove his innocence, and Detective Weeks obliges. Weeks brings in a guy from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. The examiner focuses on three questions. Did you stab Michelle? Leo answers no. Did you stab Michelle with a knife? No. Did your mother lie about your activities that night? No. The polygraph examiner tells Leo he flunked, tells him, I think you killed your wife. Armed with the lie detector results, Weeks and Putnell continue to interview people close to the couple. Weeks and his team are going around spreading all kinds of stuff. My friends are looking at me strange. I can feel it. You can feel the difference. And and on top of everything, I I lost Michelle. Months pass with Leo as the main suspect. Yet no evidence is turning up that connects him to Michelle's murder. The clothes he was wearing that night had no blood on them. Detectives don't have a murder weapon. They have an alleged failed polygraph. 
But polygraph tests don't actually detect lies. They really only measure anxiety. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that polygraph tests are not reliable and their results are not admissible evidence in Florida. The detectives have statements about Leo's temper and his relationship with Michelle and a statement from Alice Scott, who claims to have seen something the night Michelle disappeared. Still, the state attorney's office is looking over all the evidence, and they don't think detectives have enough to arrest Leo yet. There's other evidence, like the fingerprints found in Michelle's Mazda. There were just two sets of prints that were lifted from inside the car, and when they didn't match Leo or Michelle or Leo Sr., the sheriff's office stops looking for possible matches. But what's strange is that Leo and Michelle's prints aren't even in the car, which they should have been because it's their car. When I first saw that in the Florida Department of Law Enforcement's report, I wondered if someone wiped down the fingerprints. Crime scene technicians also examined Leo and Michelle's trailer. If Alice Scott's eyewitness statement is true, that she heard Michelle scream, then saw Leo carrying something heavy, like a body, and place it in the Mazda, That makes the trailer the scene of the crime. The medical examiner concludes that Michelle lost approximately five pints of blood. But they don't find anything you'd expect to find in the trailer after someone has been stabbed 26 times inside. There is no blood, just like Michelle McCluskey noticed. And no signs that the carpet had been cleaned which there should have been if Leo used the carpet cleaner Alice Scott claimed she saw him bringing into the trailer the day after Michelle disappeared. Instead, most of Michelle Schofield's blood was found in the dirt near the canal where her body was discovered. Nearly half of female homicide victims are killed by their partners, and the majority of those homicides are carried out by a male partner. So it makes sense that detectives would be suspicious of Leo. But there's no physical evidence connecting Leo to the crime, so the case stalls for months with no arrest. By the end of 1987, with no new developments, the murder of Michelle Schofield is going cold. The Polk County Sheriff's Office now has 10 unsolved murders on the books. But there's a new homicide prosecutor, Assistant State Attorney John Aguero. His job is to get the evidence from the detectives and convict someone for the murder of Michelle Schofield. He's young, smart, and very aggressive. Aguero takes a look at the Michelle Schofield case file, and he thinks he sees something. He reads Officer Cachadorian's report about his conversation with Leo Sr., and Aguero thinks there's something weird going on with the father. A vision from God led him to Michelle's body? in a phosphate drainage canal that can't even be seen from the road? Aguero is certain that Leo's father is somehow involved. His so-called vision from God that called him to Michelle's body is just too suspicious to ignore. So Assistant State Attorney John Aguero sends detectives Weeks and Putnell back out for a few more rounds of questioning with Leo. And there's a new focus. No, it's not about me anymore. They're both good cops, and we're going to talk about my dad. But the detectives don't get what they want. Leo says he doesn't know anything about Michelle's murder. And if Leo thought his dad had something to do with it, he'd give up any information he had. Not long after this, Leo is a passenger in a serious car crash where he breaks his neck. He's hospitalized, then released, but has to wear a metal neck brace for a while. He decides he's done with Florida. By this point, Leo's parents have moved back to Massachusetts. Leo tells Detective Weeks he's moving back up north, gives him contact information in Massachusetts, and asks the detective to let him know if they learn anything new about Michelle's murder. It's now May of 1988. Michelle has been dead for more than 15 months. John Aguero, the prosecutor, is frustrated by the investigation's lack of progress, so he decides he wants to talk to the neighbor, Alice Scott, himself. Alice points Aguero to Randy and Mary LaFoon, a neighborhood couple that delivers newspapers around Lakeland. Detective Weeks interviewed them both a year before, 
but they said they didn't notice anything unusual on the night Michelle disappeared. But now, under Aguero's questioning, the couple tells the prosecutor they remember seeing an orange Mazda and a pickup truck just like the one Leo Sr. drives. They were parked right where Michelle's body was found. And now, 15 months later, they say they saw those vehicles in the early morning hours of February 25, 1987, the night Michelle disappeared. Aguero might not have the evidence to charge Leo Sr. yet, but with the statements from Alice Scott and the LaFoons, he thinks he has enough to charge Leo. So in June of 1988, Leo is indicted for first-degree murder, a charge punishable by death in Florida. Aguero notifies police in Massachusetts, and he gets on a plane with Detective Weeks to take Leo into custody. Leo knows they're coming, but before he surrenders, he goes up to the roof of an apartment building he and his dad are painting, and he takes what could be his last look over the neighborhood he grew up in. He's just a few stories up, and his father joins him. And of course, I've never been arrested for anything, so I'm, I'm pretty scared. You know, I'm in a panic, and, and Dad's not saying anything. I actually went out on the roof, and I went out and I stood on the edge of the thing. <laughs> and I'm not going to lie, I, I, I honestly stood there thinking I should just drop off of it and be done. You know, I'm not going to let these people take me through hell. You know, you're not listening to the truth, don't care about the truth. And uh, my dad said something really crazy. He said, if you did it, jump. Leo's wife has been murdered. His friends have mostly abandoned him. And now, his own family is cracking under the pressure. If all you can think is that I did it, then obviously you're not caring who killed Michelle. I did not kill Michelle. And at some point, I just decided I'm going to stand for my life. Leo goes to the office of a local lawyer who has arranged for the arrest, and they wait. Then, Leo notices movement outside the window. He turns to the lawyer. I said, they're outside your window, and the SWAT team was outside the window with their rifles. So I know they, they had surrounded the building. And no, no sooner did I say that, they came in the office, and they kicked in the door, and uh, just came right off in there. And Weeks was there, Aguero was there, and uh, they picked me up, handcuffed me. I told Weeks, you're making a mistake. I kept saying that, you're making a mistake. He didn't respond to that at all. Leo is brought before a Massachusetts judge who tells him he can fight extradition to Florida if he wants. But Leo waives that right. He says he'll go willingly and gets in a car with the prosecutor, John Aguero. I told Aguero when we were driving to um, Logan Airport in in, uh, Massachusetts, uh, he asked me, how do you like the car? We were in a red Cadillac. And uh, he said, how do you like the car? I said, "Uh, and I like it, it's nice. I'm gonna make you drive me back in it. You're driving me to Massachusetts in a red Cadillac. Leo is escorted onto the plane for the flight back to Florida by Detective Weeks and John Aguero. Leo is just 22 years old, and tonight he's going to be sleeping in the Polk County Jail. I remember asking Weeks, because he sat by me, on the plane, and I asked him to not stop looking, to continue looking, and he said, why would I do that? And I said, because I'm not guilty of killing Michelle. And uh, he said, well, if I believe that, you wouldn't be here. That's when Leo turns to the other man sitting by him, Prosecutor John Aguero, Leo catches a glimpse of something shiny on Aguero's tie. It's a tie clasp with some kind of design. Leo leans in to get a closer look. It's old Sparky, Florida's electric chair. (laughs) 
Bone Valley is a production of Lava for Good podcast in association with Signal Company Number no. One. Our executive producers are Jason Flom and Kevin Wordis. Kara Kornhaber is our senior producer. Britt Spangler is our sound designer. Roxandra Guidi is our editor. Fact checking by Maximo Anderson. Our producer and researcher is Kelsey Decker. Our theme song. The One Who's Holding the Stars is performed by Lee Bob and the Truth. It was written by Leo Schofield and Kevin Herrick in Florida's Hardy Correctional Institution. Bone Valley is written and produced by me, Gilbert King. You can follow the show on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Lava for Good. To see photos and documents from our investigation and exclusive behind-the-scenes content, visit lavaforgood.com slash bonevalley.